Hi, I'm Josh, and welcome to my top nonfiction books of 2020. So, this list, as it turns out, was a lot harder to make than fiction books, and there were so many reasons for that. First and foremost, when I went to pull books as my favorite, there were just a lot more that I wanted to pull and show you than there were with my fiction books. And the basic idea is I wanted to pick a book that I remember I really enjoy reading, and also a book that made a lasting impression. Now, the nature of nonfiction, I think, is that because each book is about something real, it's easier for me to find like the signature point of the book and latch onto that so it sort of lasts a bit longer. And also so many of what I read have such profound messages that it's just easier for me to connect to that. And then when it came to actually picking which ones or the order of which ones it should be shown, I, I didn't know what to do because I love all these books for differing reasons. Especially when we talk about the fact that I read a range of different nonfiction books. I read memoirs of celebrities, of important people in history. I read history. I read politics. I read social justice books, not anti-racist books. And so how do I put a celebrity's memoir above an anti-racist book that had such a much more profound message, even if I want for other reasons to put this book above it. And these are things that are, I had to think about here, and it, it really wasn't easy. First off, I trimmed them down. I went down to 15 books because I couldn't do like over 20. Then I organized them on my computer. Then I came out here and I pulled the books. I organized them, trying to remember the way I organized it in there. And even in just the, like the few minutes between my computer and out here, there was a slight shifting in some of the books because they're so malleable and how I figure out what comes first. With that said, I think the highest books really solidify themselves, like in the top five, in the top 10. I think that's the better way of looking at this. Books that I think really stand out in the top 15, top 10, top five. With that in mind, I'll try and do my best to explain why I love these books. Just remember that there are a lot of different reasons why I'm not include a book here. There are books that have more of a profound message, but maybe I don't like the writing as much. Maybe I don't like the style, the way they presented the story. Because there's multiple reasons to dislike or not love a book beyond just what it is they're saying. And that is a much more personal feeling, I think, for a lot of us. And I've talked now for several minutes, so I hope y'all don't mind that, but I feel like it's necessary to really understand the context behind this kind of list. Okay, so the first one I want to mention to you is a memoir, and that was a book I read like a year ago now in January of 2020, and that is Robin by Dave Iskoff. I, I was wondering if I should really include this here because I can't say it really stuck out significantly, but I do remember it being the first book that I really loved, the first nonfiction that I really loved, and I remember doing everything I wanted to really appreciate Robin's life. I didn't feel like there was a lot of new information, but that was because so much of his life is already public. But the way it's presented and the way it's told is similar to the Shirley Jackson book that I talked about last year and I really love. The point is, is that he talks about his personal life and how it ties into his professional life, how the two feed into one another. And we basically walk through his personal life and his professional life as we slowly get to the point of his death. His un timely death. And I think the big reason why I chose to put this here, despite the fact that I can't say the story is particularly special and how it was written, even if I did like the way it was written, I think it's a more per per personal connection of my connection to Robin, in the sense that when we lost Robin Williams, it was the first real figure who I had a childhood connection to that I lost. And that's such a personal thing because while I know I didn't have a personal relationship with Robin Williams, I had this childhood connection and losing him is one of those key moments in your life where you start to see and realize how things go away. They change, things die and they leave you. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I know it sounds depressing, but a good life is full of loss and death. I mean, that's if you live long enough, that's what's going to happen. And this kind of story made me think about that. And it did so in a way that I could I thought was really beautiful. And I do want to reread this, despite the fact that I can't say it was necessarily like the best book of all time, but it was for me. Like, I think it deserves the 15th spot here on this list because I wanted to talk about it because of that immense connection I had to it. Next, another book that I can't say stands out as like best book of all time, but a book that I have a connection to for a number of reasons, and that is A Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, How We Know What's Really Will in a World Increasingly Full of Fake, by Stephen Novella and the rest of his cast from the podcast Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. I started this back in May with my sister. Something came up, and we weren't able to finish it, and I ended up finishing it in November. And I really love this book, even though I understand it's not necessarily your traditional book because they wrote it in sections almost as if it's like almost encyclopedic. But I think describing it that way does it a disservice because it makes it sound like it's not readable. And even though it's split into sections that I think flow really well, the actual descriptions within each section are very accessible. They've had a podcast now for over 15, maybe 20 years. And because of that, they've been able to really hone in on these topics in a way that is really easy to understand. And 
I wanted to talk about this because I also wanted to make a point to talk about a skeptic book. Like, I am a skeptic, and I don't think I read enough this last year of skeptic philosophy stuff. There are other stuff that I did read, but I don't think it deserves to be on this list. And this one, I almost picked symbolically, even though I did really love it. It's probably one of my favorite skeptic books of all time. And I think it's probably a good introduction. I mean, it is pretty dense, but at the same time, I think it's pretty easy to read. And the way that the sections are split up are fairly reasonable. And while you may not retain every detail in here, it's the kind of book that you'll be able to think about. I don't think it'll leave your mind. I think it'll really help you on a broad scale think about how you should approach decision making. So make sure you're not making spurious choices. You're not falling into conspiracies or falling into pseudoscientific practices. And if you ever have a question, it's like it's here. It makes for a fantastic basis for anyone who's looking to basically hone in on critical thinking and skeptical skills. Next is another memoir. And that is going to be the fourth memoir, I believe, of my Angelou, The Heart of a Woman. And I'm really sad because I didn't get time to listen to the abridged audiobook of this, which she narrates, which I remember I only listened to the first one in audio because it's one of the few that she narrates fully. But this story I was really happy with because while I am reading her entire set of autobiographies, I can't say any of them really were as contained as her first book because the other ones felt very much like they're a part of a, of a series a story. They're all segments going through her life. And there's a problem with that in the sense that the stories themselves don't feel very contained. So they almost feel like just excerpts from a chapter. And I, I like the first one because it felt very contained. And this one felt very contained as well. This is a time when she is um, married to an African man who she goes to Africa with, takes her young son there. And this is a part of her life where she's still learning and she's trying to understand herself and understand the men she's with and the kind of person she wants to be. That's one thing I love about this entire series is that it gives such a great insight to my Angelou who, as I've said in previous discussions of this video, is almost like an angelic figure to us. And this gives us a more personalized, more realistic view of her to help us appreciate the kind of person she was and who, how she became who she is. And I think it's necessary to really help get a clearer view of the kind of person she actually was instead of what we imagined she actually was. Okay, moving on now for onto science. The Cosmos by Carl Sagan. I have waited for so long to read this. I think I first watched the TV shows which this is sort of made in conjunction with back in 2013. It is part of what got me to switch majors from mechanical engineering to planetary science and now I've spent four years or more in Canada studying planetary science and this, this book, this, this sorry, this series, Carl Sagan in particular, was a major influence along with this podcast on convincing me that what I was doing wasn't what I wanted to do, and space science, planetary science, was what I wanted to pursue. And I was always hesitant to read this because it is very dated, like 1970s, 1980. But when I finally did listen to it on audio, first off, it's been recorded with the LeVar Burton, which that whole experience is phenomenal. LeVar Burton, narrating anything, it's phenomenal. But this science reading, oh, so good. Yes, so good. And I, what I liked about this was because it wasn't just a rehash of what's in the, the, the TV show. In a lot of ways, it is more than the TV show. It goes places the TV show can't go because of time constraints, and it expands, and we get such historical context that I think it really survives the test of time. A lot of this is still very relevant. I think it helps get the point across while giving necessary historical understanding of the, the past of cosmology and cosmos and the science of Earth, and in a way that I think is really accessible. Storytelling, especially science history, can be really difficult, and I think this does an amazing job. Add on the fact that it's narrated by LeVar Burton, and it had to be on this list. It was really a question of where the fuck do I put it? And it's kind of arbitrary why I put it, but I ended up going here because while I loved it for everything that it does, the emotional connection really isn't with the book so much as it is the everything around the book. Even though I think the book is very, very good and highly worth reading. <sighs> now moving on to the book that I said was the best book of like the first six months when I did the mid-year freakout tag. That is Not That Bad by Roxane Gay. This is a set of essays edited by Roxane Gay about sexual harassment and sexual assault victims telling their story. And it was so profound. I will say that after so much time has passed, I do think that connection I had to it at first sort of faded. I think that's more just distance and it's the kind of story that if I were to reread, I would be able to better appreciate it once again. But the stories were really profound, really strong in their messaging and, and really helped me empathize with these people, these men and women. They were just all such beautiful essays. And I think everyone should consider reading this because it covers such a range of different issues when it comes to people who, who have to deal with sexual assault, sexual harassment. It puts these issues in the forefront in a way that is drawing and off-putting 
but necessary to really focus and appreciate if we're gonna make any changes, any improvements to the society as it is right now. Next is a book in the same way of thinking, which is a memoir by Eternity Martis. They said this would be fun, Race, Campus Life, and Growing Up. And this is a memoir of her time at my university as an undergrad. Attorney Martis is a black woman, and a big part of this is basically talking about the intersectionality about being a black woman at a university. Now, it was extra powerful because of the fact that it was at my university, but I do think that it, it gets the point across, especially for Canadians, because it, it talks about Canadians at large, as well as just North America in general. Coming from the South, at least when it comes to race, it's easy to not be as aware of the overt racism in the, where I live now, largely because of the fact that it's just a much less diverse place. London is not a very diverse place as like Atlanta where I came from or Georgia in general. And so in that sense, it was one aspect that I really didn't appreciate how bad it was here at Western. But of course the issues around sexuality and, and gender is something that I was all too familiar with from the outside. It's from stories that I've heard. I don't mean to make it sound like these are issues I've had to deal with, but they're issues that are very prevalent at universities. And there's a problem with university administrations letting it happen, not doing enough to actually stop it. At the core of it, I think it's just a matter of wanting money and this, the guys bring on money so you can't do anything about them. And the end result though is that you are really destroying the integrity and also the quality of your student body because you are going to push students away from coming because of this kind of thing. There's a reason that there's such a lack of diversity at my university and it is because of the atmosphere that the administration allows and that the students create. I think we're almost halfway. Oh fuck. I forgot there was an arc that I read that I wanted to mention here. Before, they said this would be fun, and before, not that bad, but after Cosmos, I would put Camelot's End by John Ward, I think. This book I read during Nonfiction November. I read it because I was in the groove of reading political books, and it was an arc that I got granted. It's like published back in like 2019, so I was surprised that they were granting arcs at all. But because it was already published, I could just find the audiobook, I think it was on script or something, and I listened to it, and my god, the book was way better than I expected. There's so much great nonfiction out there, because I, I go into it wanting to learn about the topic, and then I'm surprised when it turns out the writer's really damn good and the topic's really interesting when talked about the right way. And this is essentially the battle between Kennedy, something Kennedy, I don't know, it wasn't John J.F. Kennedy, but it was the Kennedy who was the senator until 2009 when he died. But he challenged Carter in Carter's re-election campaign during the primaries. And I love this book because it does such a really good job of outlining their life, both before the election and after, in the context of how it all built up to this big election, which in a lot of ways I felt like mirrored modern day where we have Democratic rivals basically undermining one another and allowing po a populist candidate like say Reagan or Trump to win. And now I, I can't get into the, the details here, but if you want more about that, talk all about it in my election day reading vlog, sorry, my election week reading vlog. So please check that out if that intrigues you. But this book was, oh God, I want to read it again because it's so compelling. Oh God, it was such a blast to read. And it's really thought provoking as well. As someone who loves politics, loves presidential elections. I know people hate presidential elections, but I'm someone who actually enjoy, loves the process. I, I love this, the, the strategy of it all. And it's just really engaging in this book. And it's very prevalent. It also, I think, really reshaped the biography portion really reshaped how I see these candidates and how I think about them as people. E even Carter, who seems almost angelic himself, as we talk about Maya Angelou. Like, this book shatters that perception in a different type of way, where Maya Angelou wasn't trying to seem angelic, it's just the persona that comes up around her. While well, Carter is someone who's a politician, who intentionally tries to give a perception of the kind of person that he is, and this book really, I think, challenges that in a very effective way. Now, moving on to the next place, after they said this would be fun, Night by Eli Weasel. And I don't think it's how you say the name. I remember when I read this, looking up the name, and then it was a different way of pronouncing it, but I can't remember if that was how you say it or not. But I wanted to mention this here because uh, when I think about memoirs, it had a profound effect to me. Like, obviously, this day so this would be fun, really had a profound effect. But I had to include this one because it is, one well, a classic, but also because it, it is one of the shortest books I've read this year, yet it feels like so much happened. This is essentially his experience as a young boy being taken to concentration camps and eventually managing to survive. And it is one of the most heart-wrenching stories I've read this year. And, dear God, it was extremely powerful. And despite it being so concise, it all feels like it's so much grander, so much huger than it is because of the topic and the way he portrays it. And this book, if you haven't read it, I think really does an amazing job of conveying the horrors of this event. 
in a way that I've never really, oh God, it's, just thinking about it is getting to me, that I never really thought about and I really ex have to um, read. He has a trilogy that I would like to read and probably reread that one when I do that because very amazingly written, beautiful novel, but also tragic and, oh God, heart-wrenching. Next up is A Stamp from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. And this one, God, I had to include this because it is such a, well-written book, first off. That makes it an amazing book on its own. It's also just very comprehensive. Like, it's not slim, but reading this, I felt like, was very easy to follow because of this history of racism. It's so easily flow from one thing to the next where you, it really makes a really comprehensive and persuasive tie between the foundation of or the colonization rather of the americas to today and how racist mindsets have evolved and been reshaped to fit the time there's so much room to to expand on this book but for a start i think this is an amazing book because of how well it's written and how well it's able to cover history while also tying it all together in such a clear, distinct way. Now, I was struggling to decide where I wanted to put Stamp from the Beginning and Cass, The Origin of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson, but obviously I ended up putting this the one ahead of Stamped. And I think the reason I did that was because while Stamped is such an amazing history of America and America's racist ideas and actions, Cast is more fundamental. It is more looking at the broad scale system that is in place in America from its foundation as well as outside of America and how it has warped its way into every aspect of our lives, but also in how it damages us personally and our society as a whole. I mean, the attack on the Capitol this week, this last week, is a prime example of that, of how white supremacy, of how white privilege put our nation at risk. Democracy itself was at stake because of the caste system that is in place that would allow them to get so close because of the color of their skin. And there's a lot that I could say in that conversation. That there is the prime example of how this caste system does such significant harm on a broad scale. But of course, it also does significant harm on a, on a personal scale from the people at the bottom of, of the ladder who are the ones who are being oppressed and held down to those of us higher up who personally, I, I think it is a decay of our own personal integrity to just casually let this happen, to not actively try and fight the fact that in order for me to succeed or people like me to succeed, I am actively trampling on those below me and my success is built on their suppression. If that doesn't bother you, well then, I just don't think you're a very good person. It's pretty straightforward. There's a very personal reason to want to attack the caste system. And I love this book for so many reasons because it, it compares us to Nazi Germany and to India and the caste systems that existed there. What I really amazed me was that the caste system in, in Nazi Germany was much more emulated after America than it was we emulating after them. There's so much in here I could talk about. Actually, fuck it, we're here, so let's talk about it. There's one quote that I will not get past, where she's talking about Hitler. Hitler had made it to the Chancellery in a brokered deal that conservative elites agreed to only because they were convinced they could hold him in check and make use of him for their own political aims. They underestimated his cunning and overestimated the base of his support, which had been the very reason they had felt they had needed him in the first place. The old guard did not foresee or chose not to see that his actual mission was not to, quote unquote, exploit the methods of democracy to destroy democracy, end quote. By the time they recognized their fatal miscalculation, it was too late. Hitler had arisen as an outside agitator, a cult figure enamored of paid pageantry and rallies. It is amazing and also extremely sad how relevant that point is especially given the attack on the Capitol. So for that reason, I think I, this book had to be in this list. Next up, let's try and see this along. Brabic the Cosmos by Brian Greene. I read this back in November, and this book surprised me. This is another book that I did not read for so long because I was afraid that it was outdated. I had watched a documentary about it, but when I finally read it, it affirmed all the things I had already learned from the documentary, but also I think taking it to a new depth to help me appreciate in a way that I hadn't before. And this is basically the nature of reality. There's so much I could talk about. What I loved about it from the get-go is that it really talked about the nature of time itself. That time is just an illusion, basically meaning our perception that the now is somehow unique is all an illusion. The past, the present, and the future, and when it comes to physics, are all the same. There's every reason to believe that the future and the past exist in the same way that the now exists. Every memory we have are just as real 
as this small Israel. But you know, that's just a piece of this book because it talks about much more than just the nature of time. And I, I love it. I loved it. I loved it. It was so good. And, and personally, I thought it was a really effective way of telling the story. Keeping in mind that I have a background in science, so maybe I'm biased in the sense that it, it worked well for me at my current level of um, background on the topics. Next up, I had to mention another Roxane Gay, and that is Hunger by Roxane Gay. This is her personal memoir where she talks about her life and her body. And I thought this really encapsulates what I love about Roxane Gay, which is her wit and her insight and the fact that these struggles with her weight I could relate to in so many ways, in so many ways, especially in this last year or so during the pandemic. Like it's just something that's actually been a lifelong mental struggle for me to really deal with it. It's always something that's been back in my mind. And that part of the story just made it really connect to me in a way that I had to include in this list because of just how well it's told, her wit, her insight, and that personal connection. Now, moving on, I think to the final three. Oh my God. It's gonna be Shirley Jackson, A Rather Haunted Life by Ruth Franklin. Now, I wanted to put this higher because to me, this was the perfect memoir. This did everything that Robin did, but to the next level. Like it was Robin times 10 because this book, one told her story of her life, but then it told her her story of her life in respect to her career. But her career is is in writing, and because of that, there was so much more depth to go and to really get an insight into her psyche. And Ruth Franklin is as much a literary literary critic as she is a biographer here. And when we get these mesh, these two different worlds of literary criticism and analysis with biography. It's like mind blown. New levels of love for Ruth Franklin for this book and for Shirley Jackson. I love this book so much. I think of all these books, that might be the one that got me the most excited. So in some sense, it might deserve to be the number one. But the reason I didn't put it there was because these next two connected to me in other ways. First up is going to be, what was it again? I forgot. I know this. The Black Cabinet. The Black Cabinet. Trust me, don't let my memory hide the fact that I absolutely loved this book. The Black Cabinet by Jill Watts is a book akin to, I think, The Warmth of Other Sons in a sense that it's talking about a sect of history, about black history in particular in politics and in, in America, that is often overlooked. It's something I had never learned about. It's these group of people, these black figures, who had a some place or connection to the federal government, largely during the time of FDR, and how they basically came together in an informal way to form this group that would work together as a team, which is was a new thing for these people in these positions to do, to try and make progress for black Americans. It is a very devastating novel in a lot of ways because there's so much in the way trying to stop them because this, this is still a very racist time. I mean, even now, obviously, but the government itself, we didn't have the Civil Rights Act and they were pushing basically for that ultimate goal. And in a lot of ways, by the time it's over, I felt like it was clear how these figures were almost, I think, responsible, you might say, for the next stage of the Civil Rights Act that, that came soon after them, the 1960s. I think for that reason alone, it, it, these people deserve more attention. Mary Bethune alone, I think, is the big figure because she's really the one who brought these people together and, and, and got them to work together. And that is on a small feat because these were not people who necessarily had agreements and how to do things. And that is a problem with politics always. And it's very prevalent here. And I love this book because it's very well told. I think I gave it four and a half stars when I read it, but I have since talked about it so much when I think about history and black history in particular and good nonfiction books that I've read. And because of how it stuck in my mind, I'm realizing the four and a half was bullshit. It deserves five stars. It is five stars. So I love this book so much. It is probably the best history book I've read this year, just because of how well it's told and how engaged I felt. This book I read back in, I think, April or May, and it really instilled this urge in me to buy more f history books and to read more history and politics. Like it, it really just got me really interested in this time period and history in general. So it did everything it was supposed to. It was effective, it was easy to understand, and it was compelling, but it was also tantalizing in a way that I think is good for a history book to be because you want it to get you interested not just in what they're talking about, but in history in general. And this book was phenomenal for that reason. On to the final book. And this one, oh, I don't know if I would say it's necessarily the best written book of all time, although I do think it was well written. We'll get to that in a second. But I think it had the most profound personal effect on me. And for those of you who've been here for most of the year, I think you will recognize this book, and that is Subtly Deeply Hidden by Sean Carroll. Now, 
I did a review of this back in March of last year. I will try and link to it. I'll try and link to every book that I've talked about in the past below. But this book is essentially about quantum mechanics, but not just quantum mechanics, but about its implications on the many worlds perspective of quantum mechanics. And if you're wondering what that means, think dark matter. This book is essentially talking about the science of why the science of dark matter is actually a pretty compelling view of reality. There was strong evidence to suggest that there might actually be multiple realities, at least when it comes to quantum mechanics. And it talks about this concept in a, in a really interesting way. And even as it talks about quantum mechanics, it made me appreciate quantum mechanics in a new way, but it was something that I wanted to avoid. I did not want to think about quantum mechanics before this book. And it's got me re-energized in our understanding that science a bit more. But more than that, I don't think it necessarily hinges on your understanding of quantum mechanics either. It starts there, but he does such a good job of tying it to the next point to make his larger point of the conversation that it's okay if you don't retain every detail of the finer science that he is discussing here. What I loved really about this was the implications of the many worlds perspective, specifically that the worlds we see in dark matter, it would portray every different world as being slightly different. When in reality, quantum mechanics seems to suggest that the majority of worlds, majority of alternate realities will be exactly the same. Now, nature of quantum mechanics is very complex, so weird shit can happen. Like in one reality, I might to my bookshelf, but the problem of it happening is very low. It means in this infinite level of worlds, the majority of the worlds you go to will be identical in most ways. And what it got me really excited about was the prospect of using quantum number generators as a way of sort of making decisions. Like say you want to go get dinner. What do you want to go? You have any ideas? Then maybe you'll flip a quantum coin and whatever it says you'll do. And the idea is, is that when you use that quantum measurement, there'll be two splits. One version of you will go to one restaurant, one version of you will go to a different one. These are minor things, but they can build up. And I just think it's it's really fun to think about the implications of creating different versions of yourself. And I particularly like this because it gives us a certain level of power over our decisions and specifically over the paths we can take. I'm not saying you should make life or death decisions on a quantum number generator, but if they're minor decisions, like maybe the next book you want to read, you want to flip a coin, flip a quantum number generator coin. If this is real, I, it's just a thought provoking to think that by making that decision, it would then ensure there are two versions of you. While it might be said that there's a version of reality where that happens, the probability of it happening is very low, which means the majority versions of you, which if you think of yourself sort of as a piece of a whole, and if that whole on average is the same thing, then it's not necessarily as profound in my opinion. Like I know a lot of this is like our own personal feelings, but because of the implications, because of our ability to sort of split off, I think it's really fun, which I didn't explain this very well. So if you're interested in the idea, I would advise you go to the review of this book because I think I do a better job of really tackling it. But that's all I'm gonna say on it for now. 37 minutes, Jesus, God. And this is why I have such a hard time picking my nonfiction books. Part of me wonders if maybe I should be reading more nonfiction. If I naturally feel more energized about nonfiction books, maybe that just means that that's my preferred job. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe in 10 years time, we'll see me reading majority nonfiction because it's what really gets me super excited. That's my list. Thank you so much if you made it this far. Like really, I, I appreciate it so much. If you did, why don't you give me like a, a galaxy or something spacey? Let me know if you've heard any of these books, if you're excited by any of these books and I've talked about them because I love hearing that. Especially some of these more obscure books. I don't think enough attention on booktube. Or if you want, you can just tell me what your favorite nonfiction book last year was. But as always, I hope you all have a great day and stay safe. Goodbye.